then I'm gonna throw a two, one, and I'm gonna come over the top. That time again, wowzers. Yeah, episode 93. Back again. Ah. Crank that posture up, boys and girls. Let's get serious, huh? Damn it. Sorry, Jay. Cussing again. Grab yourself a refreshment. Let's get focused. Think about some good you got going on in your life. Huh? How about that? All right, thank you very much again, Gloria Tells. Uh, yeah, we're here with my buddy Mindset Mike. Uh, he's are you a sports psychologist. You, you can call that. You want to you say mindset coach, mental performance coach. Okay, and then you could talk into that blue light once you yeah. get a chance. Yeah. Um, real quick here, I watched the first episode of uh, the – ultimate fighter i watched it this morning mm -hmm. and uh the ufc vets they'll be on michael chandler's team and then the prospects will be on connor's team guys who haven't made it to the ufc yet uh the question will be if, if the vets the thing is once you get cut from the ufc there's two options it's like okay you either grind you go back to the local region you start fighting for two thousand three thousand four thousand dollars maybe max yeah you try to put it together three wins get back into the big show or you start looking at dip different options in your life you just spent your whole life trying to get the ufc now you got cut from the ufc so maybe you're not near as hungry to get back as you are that's going to be the question and if the vets take over i think if i had to guess i, f I feel like the vets might might take over have they been been staying hungry after getting cut but the prospects again they're going to be hungry a lot of them still be wondering in their mind if they deserve to be there or not, if they can compete at a high level. Uh, if I had to guess who's going to win, I would say the vets. But I'm looking forward to the season, and even more so, I'm looking forward to uh, Michael Chandler versus Conor McGregor. That's just going to be hectic. I mean, how can you not love Michael Chandler? That's going to be fireworks for sure. Yeah, it's going to be good. So, uh, yeah. So we have my, uh, my my boy Mindset Mike. And you, you said you were just you just got the net from... The, what, what, from the yeah, division one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I get the opportunity to work with lots of different sports. Obviously, like wrestling, MMA is a, is on the main front, but uh, I get to spend time with some really good lacrosse teams. So this is from uh, the Northwestern women's lacrosse team, and they just won their first national championship in 11 years. So they outscored opponents by 30 goals in the last three rounds of the national tournament. Damn, they just smoked them all. They smoked everybody. So who are your favorite athletes to work with? Just any athletes or... Or do you like working with mainly wrestlers and fighters, or what kind of guys do you like working? Yeah, with? it's it, it's an interesting question, right? Actually, uh, Ashley Ashley Evans just asked me the same thing, and uh, really, I would say there's like people I like to work with, and like who's the ideal person? The ideal person is typically someone with like a higher level of emotional intelligence, very coachable, um, and they don't give a fuck; they just want to get better. Right. So people that you don't have to necessarily convince of things, they'll just lean into it. You know, I'm being around so many one percenters. That's how most of them are. Like if you tell them to jump, they just say how high they don't ask why they just they, they just do it. So I would say like that's the ideal. Right. But like people that I really enjoy, um, I do enjoy work with women. Um, I think women, they just have a, a different level of emotional intelligence. It's fun. Um, I think I definitely prefer at, like sports on the aggressive side. So it's just what I can relate to, right? I'm a wrestler my whole life, just like you. And, you know, wrestling's great. I think fighting and jujitsu is more of like a violent chess game. I think it's a more cerebral sport. Wrestling's a little more brute. So I would say if I had to choose between the three, definitely uh, enjoy enjoy like the wrestling. I'm sorry, the uh, MMA and jiu-jitsu more. Um, but team-wise... I, I would definitely have to say lacrosse. Uh, two of the teams that I I get to work with teams across all sports, but you know, two of my teams in the last two years won won college national titles, one in Rochester and upstate New York, and then obviously Northwestern this year. And I don't know what your experience was with lacrosse players, but a lot of them are built here and here a lot like wrestlers. 
So they just carry a stick. Guys hit people really fucking hard. Girls are just amazing athletes. So like if I were to show you clips of uh, the girl that's going to win uh, player of the year tomorrow in DC, her name's Izzy Skane. She is a fucking boss. She runs through girls. Mm-hmm. Um, so like that aggressive mentality is definitely something that like I, I would prefer to work with. Comparatively speaking, not saying I wouldn't work with a golfer. Not saying I wouldn't work with a tennis player. A little easier to relate on the other side. Yeah. And like for wrestling, for wrestling, the periods are usually two minutes, three minutes. And there's really the art of breaking people in wrestling. In, mm-hmm. in jiu-jitsu, not so much. It's, you can be, you got to be a little bit more tactical and stuff. Mm-hmm. And guys can find spots to rest. But wrestling is just whistle to whistle. You're fucking sprinting, trying to break mm-hmm. break people. So when you were working with some uh, like wrestling and te- teams and stuff, do you talk about that a lot and the art of just breaking someone? Yeah, I don't know if you saw the recent post that uh, I had put up about a week ago. It was literally the six steps to break people. Oh. So my favorite thing is, I want to say my favorite. One of my favorite things is teaching the wrestler's mindset to non-wrestlers. So like the lacrosse team, for example, like our goal was to literally teach them how to break their opponents. So first one is push pace and create pressure. Second step uh, is make them tired. Third step is get them frustrated so they start making mistakes. Fourth step, stay aggressive and relentless. Fifth step, step in their throat. Step six, take their soul. So intentionally making that a process is something that people can stop caring about winning and losing and just focus on fucking somebody up. Mm -hmm. That's a process. Winning or losing is an outcome. Mm -hmm. But the process of breaking somebody, when you can break it down into steps, they can just get lost in that sauce. That's a lot of fun. Yeah, I like that. The six six steps to uh, breaking people. Yeah, it, it's it's completely different in wrestling compared to fighting. I mean, same in a lot of ways, but different in a lot of ways too, just because of the periods. Like the next fight we're preparing for is five five-minute rounds. Right. So you really have to pick your times to put the pedal to the metal and, and really, I mean, always invest in body shots. Always invest in body shots that's going to take the gas tank away. and Takes our will to compete away. Yeah, for sure. It starts making them second guess things. And it's crazy how body shots can really take someone that's really in amazing shape and they can start emptying that gas tank really quick. Not only the gas tank of just their physically, but even mentally. They're so fucking taxing. And then later on, it's going to open up KOs. I agree. And I think, too, um, you know, again, investing in the process of wearing somebody out, if you break somebody, they, they start to beat themselves. It's hard to beat somebody who's really good. You could break anyone. You can't beat everyone. You can break anybody or break them down. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, they start second guessing, making mistakes, making themselves more tired. And it's a lot easier to win. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, that's where upsets are made. And I feel like upsets now happen so often that I feel like I I can help engineer them because it's a process. And you just you just got to keep keep kicking like it's a windshield. Eventually, that windshield is going to fall. One of the best athletes I've ever seen kind of just put a pace on. And it was naturally, he was naturally gifted, I know he was, but he also worked. He had a crazy work ethic behind it. It's Benson Henderson. Mm. In, in the drilling, in the in the room, in sparring, even in his fights, he's just so good at just breaking people. Yeah. Just keeping keeping a pace that's not a complete sprint, but he makes it look like it's a sprint with his body. Um, who's the best person you've ever seen that can just, just so good at breaking Have people? Have a ridiculous pace. Why, when I think of wrestling, I think of Austin DeSanto. You know, I think of a kid, like if you take away his pace, what is he? He's a kind of awkward kid with a good fireman's carry. Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's really all all he's got. His pace is his best weapon. So I definitely think of that. Um, I'm trying to think of him in fighting who besides a guy like Benson just has like a constant relentless pace. I mean, once you name Benson, I really can't think of somebody better than that. He, 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 his cardio is a weapon, you know, like some, some people got a good right hand. Some people got a counter left, like. Guys like Benson, their cardio is a weapon. Oh, Colby Covington. Yep, they, they just want that five rounds. That five mm-hmm. rounds benefits them uh, majorly. Chael Sonnen was the same way, too. He for Back in his day when he fought Nate Marquardt, uh, the first time he fought Anderson, being able to change levels and press forward and shoot nonstop and shoot nonstop um, is, it takes a fucking animal to be able to do that. Yeah. So it's pretty good. Sure. Uh, this book I'm, I've been reading, it's called, uh, it's by Jim Af- Aframo. He's a a sports psychologist. It's called The Leader's Mind. This one kind of stuck out to me. It said, you can't lead others if you can't lead yourself. 100%. And you see that that all the time with with coaches that are big, fat, unhealthy people. They're not disciplined, and they expect their 
their students or their kids to be disciplined. They're like, you need to be disciplined. You need, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. and then they're just living as flat, fat slobs themselves. Mm -hmm. They maybe don't have good relationships at home. Mm -hmm. um, they can't stay disciplined on a diet, and it's hard to get behind someone and respect, uh, res really respect what they're saying. Do you agree? I agree, hundred percent. I think we grew up in a different environment where, like. I think most coaches were kind of out of shape. Most coaches were people in the past. The more that I've spent time in martial arts, um, the more you see the exact opposite. You know, most of the successful coaches, like you're in, you're in as good of a shape as any of your fighters would be to where you can go out there and be successful. And they could, they could look to you. Your students can look to you as an example. Um, I wish that like more sports took that the approach that martial arts has where like we are, we are not just experienced people that are sharing uh how to play the game you know we we should be the shining example of like what you need to be in i think that's always the debate right like what is a black belt a black belt is not a skill related thing a black belt is you know the responsibility to carry on like the those qualities of martial arts so 100 percent. i feel like uh coaches in other sports need to do a better job of that mm -hmm. especially and it says a leader has to display all those attributes they want to see in others and be willing to walk the walk. It's easy to say things, but words are mean, meaningless if they're not lived. I think a lot of coaches are that way too. They tell you, they'll tell you things that they've never really experienced at all, and it's just a theory to them. Um, yeah, walk in the walk. Walk in the walk, especially if you're a, a, a leader in any area, I think you're going to get a lot more respect. Who's a, who, who's a coach that you feel like embodies that? Who's an example that maybe you look to? Coaches that I've had in the past. I had this coach named Robert Fallis. He was always, he would, he kind of taught me how to eat organic. I learned how to eat just good quality foods from him. Uh, he would train, he would spar with the guys. He would, he would train jujitsu. He would do live rounds with them. He'd really take care of his body. He'd read, continue learning and have a good open mind. Mm -hmm. How about for you? I think... You know, in college, most of the coaches were, were, were very were very much that way. Um, they all trained with us. Like, I couldn't believe it, right? I, like, high school, I never saw that. All trained with us, all wrestled with us, all lifted with us. So I can't really think of, like, anyone in particular. But I, I'll say now, like, the head coach at Northwestern, who actually happens to be a wrestling mom as well. That's how we got connected. Um, that's a chick who's... Up at five o'clock in the morning, like on her Peloton before she takes care of her kids, before she comes into the office before everybody else, you know, like goes out of her way to live a life that like everyone on that team aspires to be her. So she's she's the greatest women's across player of all time. Um, you know, whoever you want to say is the GOAT in XYZ sports, like that's who she is for that sport. Everyone would want to be who she was as a player, but I think everyone looks up to her as much, if not equitably, as a person. And I think that's really what the coach in 2023, that's what it's more so about. You don't have to be the best athlete. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be or how to have been the best athlete. You don't have to have been the most accomplished person. But like how can you how, – how good of a job do you lead others and what kind of example do you set in a way that makes them want to follow you? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, that makes sense. This one says, Commonly events that unfold over the course of years shape a leader's character, their personality. Uh, I think Sto Stoics call it modus operandi, I think. Consequently, that leader learns how to lead more effectively in progress in communicating to and guiding others, as, as Jill describes. Yeah, I mean, a leader, uh, events that fold over the course of years shape a leader's character personality, and their personality. So if you had a coach who, who's gone through it a little bit, I think it definitely helps. Yeah, I think uh, I was just talking about this the other day. We have such little credentialing requirements to be a coach, to open a school, to open a wrestling club. You know, I, I knew people that never even made the state tournament, but opened up wrestling academies. You know, like what, what, why, why would somebody pay you monthly any fee when you haven't even gone there yourself or wrestled in college or anything like that, right? Um, and like I said, I don't think, I, I'm gonna read you something that I saw the other day that I, I threw up online. It's, you don't have to be the most accomplished athlete. The thing was, let me turn my, my music down. It'll be, great coaches learn from everyone and everything. Average coaches only learn from their experience. Bad coaches have it all figured out and have nothing to learn. And I think, you know, having been around yourself could probably say the same. Some of the best coaches like in the world in different sports, 
the best ones are always the ones that are hungriest to learn. Like they've definitely been there, done that, but they're the ones that are still asking the most questions. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, especially in Phoenix and sometimes in these training rooms, there's guys that have competed in different arts their whole entire life. Mm -hmm. So when they come in, it's like even still just trying to pick their brains a little bit in a certain position. Yeah. There's tons of things you could teach them obviously, but it, they're experts in certain areas. So learning those little things uh, from them, for sure. Just being hungry to learn always. Always. And I think that's what the greatest of the greats um, have. They have no ego. How do I get better? And yeah. same thing with athletes, minimal ego. How do I get better? How can I possibly get better? Like Volkanovsky, I don't remember if you remember when he beat Korean zombie, Joe Rogan asked him, he's like, how do you get so much better every single time that you compete? And he's like, well, it's really simple. Like, he's like, I know I'm very good. He's like, I just got to pick like one or two things every day to work on. I'm working on something every single day of practice. Like I'm going to get better. People think that there's this like magical formula and there's definitely things that build a champion, but when it boils down to it, it's people that are among other things, they're just addicted to getting better and they don't give a fuck about their ego. They give a fuck about getting better, mm -hmm. you know, and they do it for reasons that are bigger than them. Like, you know, just watching Sean earlier, right? Like, um, you know, everyone sees his personality when when he fights and you know when media and things like that they don't see the version of him that's hey did daddy do a good job today like are you proud of me did i you know what mm -hmm. i mean mm -hmm. he fights for something bigger than i think people realize and uh you know i think that's probably a credit to why he's so successful you know i i didn't sit there and have that conversation with him but i could tell how important like him making his daughter proud is to him mm -hmm. and that's something that's going to motivate him to continue to be great yeah for sure I always feel bad for other sports like mixed martial arts. It's so easy to be like, I, I always, I'm going to be getting better at something. I'm going to be studying videos mm -hmm. on something, whether it's mm -hmm. kickboxing, whether it's wrestling, whether it's jujitsu, jujitsu is always changing. Uh, wrestling even is always just changing and evolving. So you have to keep up with pace, but it's nice with mixed martial arts. You can't get really bored yeah, compared to another sport where it's like, maybe you'd get burnt out after 10 years, 15 yeah. years. You'd be like, fuck, how much more can I really learn? And then with mixed martial arts, you still, then your health comes into play. How much, how much more flexible can I get? And mm -hmm. how much more strong can I get? And how much more healthy can I get? So my, my cardio and my gas tank improves. There's just unlimited amounts where you look, can look improve. at Matt Brown at 42 years old. Yeah. You know, still knocking fucking guys out, you know, but that's a guy like if anybody knows Matt or if you listen to Matt talk, like he literally reads every day. Like he's studying to get, find ways to get better every day. He, I, I agree with you in that other sports, like I just, uh, it must, it's, it's gotta be a little bit harder. Um, I know in wrestling, it's gotta be hard. Like think, think of the guys like a Jordan Burroughs who's in his thirties now, mid thirties, and he's been wrestling since he's six. You know, he's not going to get, he's the best in the world. How much better are you going to get wrestling? God, at double X, like, spear doubles. Like. Yeah. How much better are you going to get at wrestling at this time and this time in your career, but somehow you get better. It's you so know? impressive, bro. Yeah. It's, that's, that's just a freak. Really impressive. Just a freak. Uh, okay, this one popped up too. It's called The Basic Principles of Stoicism, The Wisdom of Stoicism, consists in knowing the difference between the thing that we can control and the things that we can't. And I think with people competing, that's a tough one, Espe especially in fighting when there's a, w there's a win bonus. You get your show money, you get your win bonus. There's fucking... 20 30 thousand people in arena judges um there's the judges there's just so much that can take your attention away and you see it with the the great performers they just show up under the lights they're just mm -hmm. so good at staying in the mm -hmm. moment staying present in that 25 minutes which 25 minutes to stay present in locked in for 25 minutes that's a serious superpower well here's the thing where some of the best advice that i can give someone uh is don't fight 15 minutes don't fight five minutes, fight for 15 seconds. Like win the next position, then win the next position, then win the next position. And if you do that, rinse and repeat 15 seconds, all of a sudden five minutes is up. And then regardless of whether or not you won the round, you still got to win the next one, mm -hmm. right? Regardless of whether or not you got the takedown or not, you got to still advance position. So I think like for gener, I don't want to say for generations, but for years, you know, it was a superpower because like this, uh, my field was not well established to where, you know, you were just fucking tough and you figured it out, mm -hmm. you know, now like this is like, that is a skill. Being a president is a skill. Confidence is a skill. Relaxing under pressure is a skill. Some people have it more naturally than others, but those are things that can and need to get taught. So, you know, for someone, for, you know, for you guys having a 25 minute fight, we're not trying to win five rounds. We're not trying to win a round. 
We're literally just trying to win the next 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. And that's what allows people to stay present. Let's talk other sports. You follow football at all? Uh, not really. I'm not really a big football uh, guy either. However, you know Tom Brady, yeah? Yes. Okay, you remember, I don't know if you remember when Tom Brady's uh, Patriots were down by like three or four touchdowns in the Super Bowl against the Falcons. I do. Okay. I remember that. Uh, biggest comeback in Super Bowl history. When you listen to all of the interviews at the end, they all said the same things. Like, how did you pull this off? Like, man, we were just trying to move the chains. Like, think about what that means. We weren't trying to score, right? Because a scoring drive for one of their drives was like 13 minutes long. So we can't focus on scoring. We can't focus on just catching, passing, running. We literally just have to move 10 yards at a time. Maybe we move 20. Maybe we move th three. But if you just move the chains and move the chains and move the chains, besides the fact that it like allows you to not be overwhelmed, it also allows you to be where your feet are. And I think that's it's probably one of the biggest like performance hacks when you can learn to master. Again, some people have been around the block. They just, they've done it so much that they get it. Everybody else, them included, can be taught how to do that. Yeah, that's pretty badass. I mean, I'm always impressed with the guys, the fighters that have 13 or 14 losses and they still find them way, themselves into the title fight or mm -hmm. the top five. Guys that have had terrible injuries, have, have gone into a fight completely prepared, everything's going great, everything went right, and then they maybe snap their arm mm -hmm. or snap, blew out their knee or snap their shin mm -hmm. and then they come back. Those are the guys where it's so impressive. They know going in there how bad it can be coming out. Mm -hmm. Compared to the undefeated guys, it's like they go in there, they're expecting to just do the same thing. I think you should, you've probably seen, if you if you paid attention to this, the undefeated guys and girls, the dominant people, they're falling off more than they ever have. Um, so let's just go back to Ronda Rousey. Let's go to Amanda Nunes, Conor McGregor, um, Usman. Right, all of these people that were so dominant for so long. I mean, I think there's 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 more to it, but like ultimately, these guys, like they these guys and girls, Kayla Harrison, like they carried weight with them at some point, or they got bored. Uh, Valentina, right? I think when you're so dominant for so long, you there's no way that you can be as motivated coming into camp. There's no mm -hmm. way you're as hungry, and you're just rich. You're rich as fuck. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you just don't have the same passion. Like somebody mentioned the other day about about McGregor. You know, um, he was amazing, but he is no, like he, he's no longer at that level because he doesn't possess the same hunger that he did in his come up. So even if he's learned more, he's stronger, whatever the case may be, and he's still very talented. The guy that we saw coming up is not the guy that we see now. Mm -hmm. And especially when they take those L's, but going back to what you're saying is that, you know, these people that these, these, that have Trying to remember how you worded it. You were saying that the the people that know that they could fear the injury. What was the? Oh, the uh, the, the in here. No, where you had mentioned about the. Um, uh, it's so impressive that you know these guys have snapped like they, the they they know the consequences that could happen, but they go in there anyway and still show up and they're still in the moment. Yes. And, and present in there. Yeah. Because going back to what you said, those are the people that understand what they can and can't control. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, I think we have an idea of what those things look like. We don't realize that it actually is like preparation, effort, attitude, aggressiveness. And there's literally nothing else that we can control, mm -hmm. right? There's different words that you could throw in there, but that's the general picture. Mm -hmm. So when you know that you can't control winning or losing or the judges, you have to surrender the outcome. When you know that you can't control whether or not you can get hurt, but you did prehab during your fight camp, you took care of your body and did all the right things. You can go out there and be willing to die because you're 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 you prepared as best as you could yeah i mean same with jujitsu athletes they're always asking me in my first jujitsu tournament you have any tips my jujitsu tournament's tomorrow it's like well the work's already done yeah the work's already done especially in your first jujitsu tournament and if you've never competed in anything going out there and feeling the emotions of another person trying to take you out <laughs> of the crowd yelling at you yeah. of your parents there of just all this chaos going on uh getting those experiences as your first time um win or lose getting those experiences you're going to gain something from it yeah uh, yeah with connor though with connor it's like fuck he's still going to be dangerous in those first three no minutes what. first mm -hmm. first three minutes and with michael chandler the big moment you saw it with eddie alvarez eddie alvarez is like sh more sharp of a boxer than michael chandler but michael chandler's so explosive and he's got that threat of a takedown which changes a lot if michael chandler follows the game plan <laughs> I don't think he's gonna. <laughs> if he follows a game plan, he'll he'll do well. He just values showmanship over he does 
winning fights. Yeah, and then a moment like that, you got Conor McGregor standing next to you. God damn. I hope he, I mean, I don't know. I don't really care who wins, but yeah, if he follows the game plan, try to zap his energy, take away a little bit of his snap, try to force a couple scrambles off the rip, mm -hmm. and then uh, go from there. But he's a hell of an athlete. You fuck, he's an athlete, dude. If I, if, I mean, if you pick favorite fighters to watch, Michael Chandler's got to be up there. I think that's his goal. Yeah. You know, I think once he made all that money um, and everyone knew, like, this guy's good, but he'd rather just put on a show, I don't think is a. Uh, I, I wouldn't put him in the same as Cowboy, but, like, Cowboy's like, oh, I have no desire to really be a champion. I just want to get paid. I want to do this for a living. And I feel like Michael Chandler, not that he doesn't want to be a champion, of course he does, but he values, like, being fun to watch. Mm -hmm. And like, how, how am I remembered? But like, had he not gone for that stupid suplex against Dustin Poirier, he would have won that fight and he'd be in a separate, he'd be in a different situation. Yeah. I feel like the UFC would be smart with Michael Chandler to just say, Hey, you're getting a flat fee. You know, no, no show, no wind. You're getting a flat fee. So go let it rip. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we got some questions here from our Patreon people. Uh, Sean Quirk, what to do during the day leading up to a fight slash game slash jujitsu match? If I have a game at seven, it sucks just waiting around all day just thinking about it. Any tips would be pr appreciated. That's a great question. Do you want to do? Do you want to no, answer no, you, your first? You. Me, sure. Okay. So first of all, don't spend time thinking about your match. That's the thing. Like you, like uh, Coach had said, right? Like all the haze in the barn. You've done all the work instead of stressing out all day about what might happen that you can't even control anyway, literally do anything but think about jujitsu, watch jujitsu, do any of those things. It's the absolute opposite of what you would think. You should be like locking in, ready to go. No, you should lock in for the 25 minutes before your match and the five to 10 minutes during your match. That's it. Literally what I have fighters do like day of particularly, uh, or even other athletes, like go to Dave and Buster's, like go watch some funny shit. Go have planned distractions where you can be pushing dopamine through your body, feeling good and happy. Uh, that is the number one thing that you should do is anything but dwelling on what's coming because you can't control it. You're just going to sit there and stress about it. So I don't know if you remember in, in the, or if I mentioned this in the podcast, like one of the big things that I do to help people unburden themselves getting ready for f uh, big fights or, or tournaments, things like that is, you know, the 30 days before we turn it into a holiday. So like literally like Christmas, things like that. We get trees up, listen to Christmas music, 30 days of like building up excitement and anticipation. Ah, oh, you know, that's pretty cool. Like, I'll show you a video later. It's pretty, mm -hmm. pretty sweet. But the, the moral of the story is that like day of week of, you shouldn't be focused on what's going to happen. If anything, like redirect, yourself to being excited that you finally get to do it because the closer we get to christmas we don't get stressed mm -hmm. we get excited but why is it that the closer that you get to this tournament that you wanted that to you do. wanted to do you chose to do it mm -hmm. so why are you going to choose to be stressed instead of excited like don't put a gun in your head and say be stressed mm -hmm. right you're choosing stress because that's what you're conditioned to do so just choose excitement yeah. that's that's an intentional thing it takes time mm -hmm. yeah and and i think one thing that helped me i think it was I forgot who's, who told me, but just trying to enjoy those emotions, those emotions mm -hmm. of being not sure what's going to happen, that little bit of kind of fear that's raising up in you. It's enjoy normal. those emotions. You're not going to get those forever. There's going to be a time when you're 50, 55, and you never get those emotions again, so maybe try to enjoy them. Um, do you ever, w with your athletes, do you ever encourage them to learn to meditate? So uh, that is not a part of like what I do that I specialize in. However, having, this is my second season with Northwestern, um, visualization is something that I've encouraged. Meditation is something I've encouraged, but I never really engaged in it. Spending a lot of time in person with them, uh, their coach Kelly Hiller does uh, does a meditation session with them before every game. So I was with them before the quarterfinals, before the semifinals, and before the finals. And watching them do her guided meditation was like lights out. You know, I, I I've never said meditation isn't great. I've just Never gotten to the point where I've led breath work or anything like that. Mm -hmm. You know, hey, explore it on your own. It's valuable. Mental imagery is great. I watched her lead it. It was, I was ready to run through a fucking wall and put on a jersey and pretend to be a girl for, for 60 minutes. Damn. You know, like just getting them to be, getting you to stay present in like that moment, whether it's before a game or not, 
100% will allow you to block out distractions in difficult moments. Mm -hmm. That's what most of us can't do. Because I could see the girls in the room that are like fidgeting with their hands, that like can't keep their eyes closed. They, they struggle mm -hmm. in the moment. Um, when you can learn to push those things aside and choose what you want to focus on and do that in a guided process, I think it pays off a lot. But it's only a, what, what, I, what I do tell people is that it's, it's, it's a component. Don't think of all of mental training as visualization, meditation, and shouting affirmations because those, those three things alone are not going to win a championship. Um, I think they are very valuable and underutilized tools, though. Yeah, I mean, especially with the meditation when you were talking about earlier, just being where your feet are at. Mm -hmm. If you can just, you have a constant practice of that every day, mm -hmm. being where you're at, being wherever it is, and you can bring yourself right there at that moment, and you're mm -hmm. good at bringing yourself there by just following your breath or whatever it is, I think it definitely can help. Meditation also allows you to, like, people, we said this on the last podcast with Timbo and the Sugar Show, is that thoughts are just things. They're not good or bad. And people do not, they, you should accept them all. And people don't do that. People that meditate, that's part of guided meditation. Is that like whatever comes, accept them all. Just put them where they need to be. It's okay. There's no good. There's no bad. Mm -hmm. And that is something that unless you were taught that in a process or unless you do meditation, that is not something that anyone can easily do. Mm -hmm. So we've all been there before. A weekend trip to the casino canceled because of real life came calling. Well, my bookie's new and improved online casino is here to change the game. Dive into a truly realistic casino experience featuring the latest in slots, progressive jackpots, and live dealer action, all from the comfort of your own home. Take advantage of weekly blackjack tournaments and a brand new collection of high-end games for a chance at real cash rewards. The MyBookie Casino provides a Las Vegas experience when the action's in your hands. And the best part is you don't even need to wear pants. Your adventure at MyBookie Casino begins today with a generous sign-up bonus using code REDHAWK, all caps. That's promo code REDHAWK to secure, secure yourself a sweet deposit bonus. And that's not all because their revamped loyalty program ensures that you'll be showered with rewards, including free spins, cashback offers, and a host of exclusive VIP perks. The more you play, the more you win. Play anytime, anywhere with the My Bookie Casino. Love it. Okay. So I hear Sugar talk about visualizing a lot before a competition. How can you effectively use visualization to enhance your performance, especially in something like maybe it's Jiu Jitsu? Uh, wrestling or fighting? How do you how how would you instruct someone to do that? Great, great question. So I think that one of the things that people struggle with is one, they don't know how to be present. Period. Um, even if they're not an ADD person, they get very ADD when they're supposed to be calm when they try to visualize. So they don't allow themselves a safe space to relax. One, two, um, they only visualize like how it's like the perfect way it's going to go. That's not realistic. I always tell people like, if you're going to visualize, also visualize adversity. So let's take wrestling. Visualize yourself getting taken down, but you get right back up. Visualize like some worst case scenarios happening, but how are you going to respond? Countering it. Countering, doing those things. Visualize yourself dominating, but not flawlessly, you know, because a lot of people will visualize these like absolute destructive performances but then it doesn't go that way and their brain's not ready for it. So I think visualization is something that is, uh, is something that would be people pause. My best suggestion is that when you visualize also visualize like overcoming adversity mm -hmm. and come into the session with intention of like what you want to work on. Don't just let your mind go wherever you want. And I'm going to imagine just smashing people, mm -hmm. you know, and then you come out and you get cracked right off the rip and you get dropped and you didn't visualize that at all. Mm -hmm. Or you get caught in an armbar right off the rip and you didn't vi in visual or visualize that at all. I remember Coach Matt Lindland told me, he's like, just what, whatever happens, especially when you're visualizing, whatever happens, just have a counter to it. Okay, you're mm -hmm. caught in an armbar, that's okay, stack them up. Mm -hmm. You get taken down, okay, we can do stuff the head. Just what, what's your counter to every bad position mm -hmm. and run through those also. And that helped out. Yeah, but the visualization is hard but super powerful. Would you super agree? powerful. Agreed. It's you are consciously training your subconscious mind. Mm -hmm. 
So I think if people do it with more intention and they come into the situation, like, all right, today I'm going to visualize these things. Tomorrow I'm going to visualize these things. Uh, an another little known tip that people don't realize, don't visualize in your bed. That's why you're supposed to not have a TV in your bedroom. Your brain is supposed to see a bed and think sleep. If your brain relates it to TV, then your brain doesn't know, am I sleeping? Am I watching TV? I don't know. Um, I'm not saying this is like a massive difference, but like studies show that technically you're not supposed to have, but your bed should be, your brain should see bed and think sleep. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to be in a focused meditative state that doesn't want to just go to sleep when you lay in your bed. So that's why you see a lot of like elite athletes, like especially at the Olympic training center and stuff, they'll visualize on the mat. They'll uh -huh. visualize like places like in the back corner of the training room, you know, and like near the cardio area. They'll just disappear into that, but it's not in their bed. Um, same thing with your couch. Like if you want to go on your couch, it's fine. But if your brain relates, like I, I, I love taking naps on my couch. Probably not the best place for me to visualize. Mm -hmm. I should visualize somewhere that my brain doesn't relate to sleep. It should relate to work. Damn, that's a good tip. Yeah, I mean, nowadays, especially with the younger kids coming up and stuff, they just get so much stimulation constantly with the phone, with the iPad, with the video games, with the TV. It's never not stimulate, like stimulation, never not. And then when their mind doesn't have it, it's just like anxiety. Like, I got to find something. I got to grab it. I got to get back, back on my phone. We're, we're addicted to the dopamine trip. Yes. And, not, and like not in a good way. That's why and, we like Amazon. And then you get a little break and you learn how to enjoy that break mm -hmm. and find find something, which I mean, just look into nature or just whatever it is, you just, you realize how good it feels to just give your mind a little break from stimulation. Mm -hmm. When have you ever seen somebody take an intentional social media break, post about it and didn't say it was like, wow, I'm so glad I did that. Yeah. What have you ever saw them be like, no, it sucked. Like I definitely want to be on my phone 24 mm seven. -hmm. No one's ever said that. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Uh, additionally, what is this? question uh this one here's some sports psychology type stuff that transfers to life mm -hmm. what would you say or like top three or top two um i'll talk i'll see where it goes the number one piece of advice for that i could say where sports psych translates to life and is the number one contributing factor to like my individuals or teams that have had like the most success hands down is learning how to make gratitude your dominant attitude. Not in a YouTube motivational way, like genuinely being an opportunity oriented person. I get to do this, I don't have to do this. Um, I, I believe there's like levels to gratitude that we can get into, but bottom line is that like when you operate from a place of gratitude, gratitude is the entitlement killer. Entitlement is what's fed, is what the, is what's the ego's filled by. Um, and gratitude is a selfless, pour into others, I'm excited for this. Stress doesn't exist. Thankfulness and, and stress literally do not coexist in your brain. It is like oil and water. So if, if you think about it as a balance, if you're operating on 90% gratitude, then you have room for 10% stress. So moral of the story is that like when you can learn to intentionally practice gratitude as a way of life, not just something you do, but who you are, the, the translation it will have in every other part of your life is more transformative than anything else that you could do. Can you have gratitude like if you've never been through anything tough? You've never even been in a tough position. You never broke a bone. You've a never, you never get tired. You've never done a cold punch. You've never done any of this stuff. I feel like it would be hard to have gratitude. I think it's hard to have the same kind of gratitude as those, I think anybody can have gratitude. I think what you lack is, the, is, is, is a experience to give you a perspective to have a deeper meaningful level of gratitude. Like the gratitude that you and I could have from having tons of chosen suffering in our life, chosen and unchosen, compared to somebody who's literally never suffered, never done a combat sport, everything's on a spoon fed. I think that person could be grateful, but probably not the same way that like you or I or other people can. Yeah. Someone who survived cancer, um, probably a different level of gratitude than those of us that have overcome a knee injury, mm -hmm. right? So I think there's a really good point. And I think choosing suffering, choosing difficult things is an easy way to build gratitude when you do it for that purpose. Versus let, let's think of the old school dudes, like the old school MMA fighters. They just did hard shit to be fucking hard, mm -hmm. right? Versus now let's let's do hard shit 
for the purposes of building resiliency. Let's do hard shit for the purposes of, uh, I'm going to do a cold plunge for the cognitive benefits, not just because it's fucking hard. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm doing these things so I can appreciate the days that um, are easier. I'm doing these things so when days get harder, I don't feel like I'm obligated to deal with shit. It's like an opportunity to test my fortitude. So I spot on. I've never heard somebody say it like that. That was, that was, that was good. Okay, we got, uh, I love this one from Chris Polanco. Any pro athletes that you've worked with and what do they tend to suffer from? Like what are some issues that pro athletes have had? Yeah, so I mean, the highest levels of MMA, people like Zhang Weili, Figueredo, uh, Patricky Pitbull, you know, you think of people like that. Um, I would say, it was pretty public, so I don't mind talking about it. It was, if he wants, to, if you, you want to read the ESPN article, where uh, Mark Ramundi had interviewed me about working with Wei Li, most of them, when you get to a certain level, um, they lose their sense of why. Like, why did I get this? Why did I get here in the first place? Why am I doing this in the first place? Um, or if they take an L, right? Those people that were successful for so long, they take an L, like she lost to Rose once and then twice. Um, you know, she, f- because she hadn't lost in so long, she forgot, well, like if I'm, if, if I'm, if I'm not winning, then like, what am I even doing this for? You, you didn't get into fighting to win. You know, she had to find her purpose. So I would say that's something people struggle with. Um, the let's let's think of some of the other guys. I think the expectation, right? A lot of people start competing with like the expectation of because they are who they are, they've done what they've done, then they have to, then like they have to win. Instead of like, no, I get to compete at this level still, right? You know, you, Patricky, very successful family, you know, champion, all these, all these sort of things. A, a guy like Figueredo, um, you know, I've, I've, I've been champion so many times. Like, I, I, I can't lose. I have to win. I, I think that's a pretty typical thing. Um, some of the other things that I would say professional athletes really struggle with, it's their career. There's a lot more on the line. Mm-hmm. Um, again, if you operate from a posture of gratitude, where remember when you were 16 dreaming of this job, dreaming of these problems, and now you're sitting here complaining and stressing and worrying about them. Um, but for the national championship, I told all the girls, I said, you're going to have moments over the next two days. You're going to be stressed. We're going to be worried. It's normal, right? This is important to you. But I want you to dial back to when you were like 10, 11, 10, 10 or 11. You dreamed about being one day being a Northwestern lacrosse player. You dreamed about the opportunity to compete in a national championship like you are today. And when you start going down that shitty road of, sh- of worrying, what if this, what if that, talk, imagine what your 11-year-old self would say. They'd be so jealous, even be sitting in your shoes that they'd smack you in the face for worrying about it. That's gratitude. Like, I'm so happy to be here. and I'm going to choose like, to be courageous over like let the stress of the moment get to me you know yeah that's good i like that a lot okay this one here is uh michael cahill advice for a fighter who doesn't know or have a clear cut out why do you need a why Mm. um you need one if you want to be successful long term um when, when when you know your why you know your way so you seem like a guy that probably likes stoic stuff um there's uh Oh, he's not really a Stoic philosopher, but the Stoics relate this a lot. Frederick Nietzsche talks about um, a man who knows his why can suffer anyhow. So if you don't know why you're doing something, you're not strongly connected to it. When things get difficult, you struggle how to figure it out. Versus, you know, if something... Why do you think people survive shipwrecks? Because if they don't figure it out, they're going to die. Why do people survive enemy territory? Because if they don't, they're going to die. When you're faced between death and success, you tend to succeed. But like, you you have to you have to be intimately connected to those things because the days that you don't feel like training, your why is what pushes you through. You know, motivation, not motivation. Your why is what when you don't feel good. Your why is when you wake up on the wrong side of the bed. Your why is when you take an L. Like your why is what gets you forward. And and I mean that like genuinely not in a motivational way. You know, you, you got to have. To be in alignment, you need to be connected to why you're doing it, what you love about it, and you got to have a process to continually to get better. If you lack that why, that's like not having, it's like building a house on sand. 
Everything else doesn't matter. I don't care how fucking cool your house is. The, the foundation to your house is not built strong. So if you don't know how to find your, I'm, I'm talking to him like yep. he's in the computer. Yep. Um, if you don't know how to find your why, sit back and ask yourself, like, why did you get started in fighting in the first place? Why are you still fighting? What are the things that you enjoy about fighting? What is the reason that you're choosing to fight and suffer and cut weight and do all those things? So I'll say one more thing about that. I, I, I was doing a, a training with Matthew McConaughey, Tony Robbins, and Dean Graziosi. And they said, sometimes you got to go like five to six layers back, right? So why do you fight? Well, I want to make it to the UFC. Why? Well, because I want to be able to use this as a career to provide for my family. Why? Well, oh, never thought of it like that. Uh, well, uh, we struggled growing up. My dad hated his job and he didn't make money. I want something different than that. Why? You go like five layers deep on that. Why? You'll have something deep in your heart that'll push you through a lot of shit. And if it's like chicks and money, mm -hmm. that's not going to push you far. Or maybe it will because at the beginning of Suge's career, that's why he did it. Mainly chicks. But then the money started coming. <laughs> yeah. So... Thank you for that. Uh, Ezra Elliott, this is our buddy here. So the, when the kid was out that was out there. Fucking phenomenal wrestler. Good at Greco. Good at upper body stuff. The one that at, was just with uh, yeah. Sean. Good at yeah, taking the back. The kid's fucking an animal. Uh, he says, how to get the most out of every training session and how much to think about martial arts, visualizing, watching techniques when you're not training. Uh, I remember this Jim Aframo. I actually got to sit down and just talk to him for a while in Scottsdale. And he said, just like a car, like, you need to find a way to turn your mind off of it mm -hmm. at, at times. You, you put a car in the garage running, it's going to eventually run out of gas. Because I had that same question for him. I'm so obsessed with it. I think about it all the time, like too much. I know it's too much. Uh, what would you say? How to get the most out of every training session? How much to think about martial arts, visualizing, watching techniques when you're not training? So you, going back to the question before with regards to like where do professional athletes struggle? Balance. Mm -hmm. I asked Whaley, Whaley, what do you do besides fighting? Nothing, just train. Well, what do you like about fighting? Winning. Well, like, why do you fight to win? Right? Like, there's no, there's nothing else. So there's a pretty high profile college wrestler that I work with right now. And he was number one pound for pound in the country when he was in high school. One of the things that I was telling him is that, like, for you to get to that next level, that, like, upper 5% of your ability, you actually need to have things besides wrestling in your life. Like, you need to dedicate time to something else. It's... You're a, what got you here is what's going to get you there. When I get to that next level, like to be, to become good or great, like you have to be somewhat obsessive, but you also have to have some balance and like literally do other things. So to answer his question, like, you know, I think it's, um, how to get the most of each training session, have a plan, like have clear intentions of what you want to accomplish, um, in practice that day and then evaluate that plan at the end of the day. How good of a job did you do? Get data, right? The, Practice is an opportunity to get better. Training is an opportunity to get better, um, not an obligation to suffer or lose weight or you know prepare for your fight. So if it's an opportunity to get better, let me walk in with an idea of what I want to work on. Like I don't know what Tim's gonna do tonight at Nogi, but like I know if if I'm on top, I'm looking for this. If I'm on bottom, I'm looking for that. If I'm a neutral, I'm looking for this. I'm gonna do whatever the class is, but like I'm looking for these three things. At the end of the class, okay, how good of a job did I do? Treat your training like millionaires and billionaires and CEOs treat their financial reports. And I think if we, if we manage our focus and our intentionality, the way that rich people manage their money and how often they look at how to make more money, I think we get a lot more out of it. So come in with a plan, evaluate your plan, rinse and repeat. And then at a minimum once a week, look at the, look at the week as a whole, but every train, you have two trainings, do it twice. So instead of just showing up and working hard, getting 1% better, you're getting significantly better because you're training with intention. Then you are evaluating what you're doing so that you actually got better. Not just let me run a race with my head down and hope it works out. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. That's good. Uh, Justin Lathy, any books that you would suggest? And what's hmm. the best way to just mentally prepare for war? We kind of covered that all the way. Any books that you suggest that you really like? Chop wood, carry water. Chop wood, chop carry wood, water. carry water by Joshua Metcalf. Good one, huh? Yeah, it's uh, it's falling in love with the process of becoming great. It's a guy that wants to be a samurai. Every day, he's like, "When am I going to learn how to be a samurai? When am I?" He's going through the samurai training. He's like, first, you're just going to chop wood and carry water, right?" And it was just like falling in love with the process of becoming great. Everybody wants to be great. Everybody likes the idea of being great, 
they don't like all the shit in the middle that it takes to be great. Mm -hmm. So the people that become great and stay great are the ones that love the process more than the prize. So that's one of the best books. And I feel like it's not a seminar when you read it. It's a story. You get so wrapped up in the story, but it's so good at teaching the lesson. There is a, um, there's a quote in that, uh, in that book that talks about, like when we talked about surrender the outcome, uh, I got it directly from that book. And, you know, to summarize, because he talks about war, the man who is least likely to die is the one who has surrendered to the fact that that's exactly what might happen. When you go to war, the person you want beside you in battle is the one who surrendered to the fact that he might die. Mm -hmm. So he competes without, he fights without fear of what if instead, because the focus on, well, what if I die versus like, I'm just going to fucking fight, mm -hmm. you know? So I think that's, that's probably one of the, the best books that I've ever come across and that was given to me by the central michigan wrestling coach years back love it damn that's badass yeah because i mean you you work with guys like figure eight or way lee and all these people who are like experts they're so good at almost everything it's almost hard to kind of almost even figure out what you want to work on it's just like you've been at it for so many years just staying in it um what's interesting is that the better the athlete the more that they know what they what their what their vulnerability is, you know, um, it's only the people that just don't know what they don't know, right? There's a, there's that graph like this is what you know, this is what you don't know, this is what you don't know about what you don't know, mm -hmm. right? But I think a lot of those guys and girls, even if they don't know directly, just like with some guided questions, it's really easy to figure it out. But most of them will come right to me and be like, "Yeah, I struggle with this." Like you know, I I, I literally just spent one evening with with Figueroa during his camp. Ah, uh, Captain Eric brought me in. Just wanted to kind of bring him through some stuff and like tune him up before. This was when he beat Moreno. Um, and, you know, it was, hey, he struggles with this in this situation. All right, like this. And like, what, 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 what about this? And like, maybe the first time or second time, like, he, he, he grew up pretty interesting. He's not your, you know, typical dude. Mm -hmm. So he didn't, he never really thought about it. But even a guy that like, Again, not a super cerebral dude. A couple questions, he, he immediately got it. Versus you take a guy like John Jones, right? Sitting down and training with him. Mike, what do you think about training today? Like, what do you think I need to work on? I'll say something. He's like, yeah, you know, I like that. I, 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 but I also noticed like this and then that. Mm -hmm. Those guys are so focused on like, just what do I do? Uh, I'll, I'll give you another great example. I was at the PI the other day and I was wrestling with Marvin Vittori. And uh, my buddy, Chase Pammy, shout out to Chase. If you're in Vegas, you need a wrestling coach, you find Chase Pammy. He runs Gold Rush Wrestling Academy. And he does, uh, runs practice at the PI a couple times a week. Like exceptional wrestling coach and has done a great job with a lot of good fighters. Marvin was in his class. And Marvin, as good as he was, you know, I'm like, I'm seeing some really simple holes in his, in his wrestling. Mm -hmm. And so just pointing it out to him, I'm like, you realize that like the reason you couldn't take down Adesanya is the same reason you're struggling taking down this guy, even though you're way bigger, faster, stronger than him. And he's like, okay, really? And then asked me 25 questions. And then if I, if I didn't stop the conversation, would have stayed for like two hours after practice, continuing to ask questions. You know, I'm sure like you, Sean, like guys that want to be great or that are great, like they're all very similar. Mm -hmm. It's not like there was a, a meeting where, okay, if you want to be great, these are the things that you do. But I've gotten to be around so many different coaches and athletes of different sports. You all talk the same. You all say the same shit. We all focus on the same shit, right? We all can learn from each other, but it's there's the addicted addiction to getting better it's across it's the board. Yeah. Fuck yeah. Jackson Lewis. Okay, this is the last one here. A lot of the ones, a lot of the comp, uh, ones we already kind of answered talking yeah. about this stuff. Uh, with the concept of the shadow and split personalities in martial arts to handle guilt and anger, is there a healthy way to control or integrate the shadow or is it an unhealthy concept altogether? Because I've wrestled with an angry dark side of me since I got my first surgery 11 years ago and I've done research, but I'm sort of stuck. Thanks for any advice. Grateful, Joe. I think he's asking, is it good to wrestle angry or emotion mm. with emotion? Um, I think. Those sort of emotions are not sustainable. Um, you you can have we, we've all gotten angry and hyped up and fucked somebody up, but anger is not a sustainable. Um, anger and overly intense energy is not a sustainable thing on on an on an energy management level and on a f emotional focus level. It's fueled. Um, 
in a way that think about like gasoline to a fire. You add gas to a fire, you may not be able to control it. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it burns the whole fucking block down, right? So learn how to like operate in a place of neutrality where you may, you may have had success with that, like the anger and the, and that sort of intensity, but it's better to fly in a neutral gear. It's also better, like I said, operate from a place of like gratitude. Like if you're struggling getting back from the injury, like be thankful that like you've gotten back from the injury, be thankful that the injury wasn't worse. And then instead of like being stressed about whatever happened in the past or like allowing the anger to take over, like no one's forcing you to be angry, right? Like if you're, you're angry, then you are choosing to direct your energy in a way that's like not helpful. So the simple answer is find more sustainable emotions that allow you to focus. Gratitude, excitement, um, just being neutral. That's sustainable. And that's the, that's the Penn State versus Iowa, right? Penn State, they're laughing, joking before their matches. 45 and five in the national semifinals. Nine out of 11 national titles. Laughing, funning, funning. Laughing, having fun, loving life. Always talk about how much fun they're having when they're wrestling. Iowa, super serious. Two years ago, went one for five in the national finals. You know, they habitually do not win the big matches at the end of the year. Phenomenal program, nothing but respect, but there's a staunch difference. One team operates over like intensity. Other one is calm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, se yeah, it seems like exactly what you're saying. It seems in the even top five or even championship people, when's the last UFC fighter you saw that just got angry in there? That just got angry in there. Zero. I think maybe maybe for some people, maybe guys like back in the day, Chris Lieben or something. Yeah, maybe to I compete. Too. And I you, just and, sat next to him on a plane. Yeah, he's <laughs> yeah. a character, is he? Yeah. And maybe you win. Maybe you get successful. But to win at an elite level, I think it's almost best to just almost have no emotion. I would say neutral or happy. Like think of Adesanya, Volkanovsky, John Jones. Like they... they whether it's real or not, like whether it's genuine or not, at a minimum, you see the you see this the the big champions are consistently either neutral, here manageable, or they're excited. Yeah, like dude, fucking Adesanya versus uh, Pereira, the second fight, like mm -hmm. what an animal Adesanya is, just mentally going into that. He he, but he's like a real life, uh, not anime. What's the what's the Dragon like, Ball Z? Like, yeah, he's like a real life Dragon Ball Z character. Uh -huh. Like, he's not a human. Yeah. The things that he says are just like, just so next level. He's probably top five on my list of people. I just want to sit down and be like, can you just talk? I just want to listen, like, what you've like. Here's like 10 questions. Can you just, I just want to hear what you have to say on, on all these different things. Yeah. But so he, he, here's the thing dopamine versus cortisol, stress versus happiness. Your brain does not know the difference between stress and like overwhelming intensity and anger. So like it's really intense. Your brain relates that to stress, just like we look at the bed and we think sleep, not let me go focus and meditate, right? So you need to operate from a place where it's like dopamine driven and you can be consistent and it's manageable. Not like, well, I work, like sometimes I do real well. No, you'll do well almost all the time, at least as well as you can, if you can manage your focus and your, your energy. And like I said, that place of neutrality and fun is mm -hmm. where you see most champions are now. Hell yeah. Like, I wonder, I would just love to sit in the room for a couple practices or something just to see the way Kale Sanderson coaches. He's probably just such a badass coach and just to see how successful they are. Uh, have you been around him much? I have. I have. Um, actually, at the PI, I watched him run the whole practice. Mm -hmm. um, so one of my biggest mentors is, uh, when, I, when I talk about gratitude, like I owe, like, a lot to the Sanderson family because Kyler, uh, his youngest brother, who runs a club in Utah called Sanderson Wrestling Academy, Kyler really just like poured this into me a couple years ago when we first became friends. He invited me to do camp out in Utah. Then, so I spent time with Kale and I spent time with his brothers, but I immediately, after conversation, I was like, why are you so good at this, dad? Why are you so good at this, dad? So I'm like, all right, dad. Like, I'm gonna <laughs> spend time with you now. My bad. No, you're good. So I was like, all right, dad, like I need to, I need to ask you questions and learn a lot. 
um, especially about gratitude. Going back to what you said, haven't watched them practice. Doesn't say much. He doesn't say much. I think I, I will share one, one funny story. Um, they play the same song the entire practice. Really? The same one. On repeat. On repeat. What the? Um, you know that song, Pump It Up? Pump. Uh, like uh, whatever that fucking Jock Jams Volume 5 song. No, 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 pump it up. You got to pump it up. Like oh. at, at the PI, they played it for like an hour and a half straight. <laughs> so everyone's like, the fuck? Those fighters are like, what the fuck? So very calm, very laid back. Loves his guys more as people than he cares about them as wrestlers. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of technique that goes on in the room, but like they're a culturally driven program. They recruit in a culture, they develop a particular culture and they allow them to wrestle very free with like, Hey, here's like some of the tips that have helped make us great. You know what I mean? Yeah. Let them be their selves. Yeah. Like let them be their selves. So he's like, if you look at him in the corner, like everyone needs to do a better job of studying what Kale and his people do. Everyone's so focused on beating Penn state. No one's taking the time to do what I did, which is just meticulously study the program. Mm -hmm. Like, what do you do culturally and developmentally to make all your guys successful? Now let me try and do that on in my own in my own way with like some of the athletes that I work with. Kale always talks about the number one theme in his program is gratitude, right? And again, like I got that from Kyler teaching me, his dad, some of the guys that were on the team, and uh, you know, he is such a calm but like funny demeanor. And he's a guy that constantly asks questions, always looking for feedback. He is um, not what you would probably expect for like most wrestling coaches. You know, in the corner, when have you ever seen Kale lose it? Yeah. Once, David Taylor against Jaden Cox, where they didn't get the stall and call. Mm. That's it. He threw a chair. And it's like the only time you've ever seen him even yell. Mm. He didn't say much. Yeah. You know, he's just there for support because the hay's in the barn. Yeah, and everyone respects him so much that they're going to show their best. Mm -hmm. That's badass. So, all right, this weekend, I, well, tonight, actually, I'm going to go to Long Beach for the Jiu-Jitsu World Championships. I've got two people competing. It's awesome. Uh, one tomorrow and then another Saturday. And they both have big brackets. This is going to be a tough tournament. I think there's over 50, 60 kids in each one of their brackets. And this is the best people in the world, especially in the gi. Kids are coming from Brazil trying to make a name for themselves. They've been training since little teeny boppers. So going to go there. Excited excited to watch a bunch of jiu-jitsu matches this weekend. And uh, come back Sunday and get back to work. And then we're going on George Janko's pod Sunday. We'll re record the Timbo Sugar Show. And uh, that's that. What do you got going on? This weekend, so um, it was back-to-back -back Final Four in NCAA Championships. So I, uh, this is my week. Like I go from wrestling season straight into lacrosse season. And obviously all the individual clients in between. This is my week where I'm in Phoenix just vacationing with my family. Fuck yeah. So my mom and my sister live here. My daughter came. She's spending the week. So literally just trying to do a whole bunch of nothing. Like let me wake up early, go to the gym. Hang out with my kid all day. Went whitewater rafting. Sweet. Like do that sort of stuff, and so I want to do. And then, uh, you know, I, I'm supposed to extend my my vacation a couple of days here. Just like, just again doing nothing. Uh, Shutting it I off. Need, I need a recharge. Hell yeah. Um, a lot of emotion going into the last couple of weeks. You know what I mean? Oh, uh, were you talking about Mike and say uh, where people can follow you? Yeah, sure. So um, easy place to find me is always Instagram mindset underscore Mike. Uh, easy place to find me. Uh, you can contact me there, DM me. Uh, you know, happy to either answer your questions, whether it's like quick tips or ideas about how to do, you know, how to train together. Um, and probably the, probably, yeah, I would say that that would probably be the best way. And if you get to the point where you exchange numbers, cool too. Boom. I appreciate it, brother. And then guys, check it out. Content's still going up there all the time. Patreon.com slash Red Hawk Academy. Uh, Jay's whipping up a weekend vlog. We had a pretty fun weekend and he's going to, we're going to throw that up there too. It'll be on YouTube, like probably a week later or something, but, uh, there's discounts on there. There's all sorts of stuff on there. So patreon.com slash Red Hawk Academy. If not shoot the pod a like, uh, it helps out. All right, guys have a good one. See you later.